Um, I would like to thank uh, our host, Herman Miller, and I would like to thank our annual sponsor, uh, the Big Ass Fan, and also Color Living. Uh, well, before I pass the uh, mic and the podium to Jason Carlo, uh, he is our curator and moderator for this event. Uh, I would just uh, quickly update on uh, AI Hong Kong's past events and uh, let our audience know that what had happened in the last couple of months or last few months. Quickly, uh, you will see that uh, that was AI event happened last Thursday. Uh, our speaker is Chris Yao from Taiwan and that was a fantastic uh, lecture by, by Chris talk about uh, tangible and intangible in architecture. And the next one I'm going to show is uh, the last advanced technology series, the uh, first event, uh, happened in April 21st, which is a wonderful, wonderful uh, lecture uh, by our very special guests and speakers. And uh, in April 15, uh, AI Hong Kong also uh, held um, the first ever Young Architect Forum in Hong Kong. And we invited uh, six firms, uh, young architect firms from Korea, Bangkok, China, and Hong Kong. And that was a wonderful afternoon. And uh, on March 23rd, AI Hong Kong also held a first quarterly meeting we invited a speaker from China, Professor Li Xiaodong. Uh, Professor Li actually uh, presented a very uh, different uh, architecture and uh, everyone were enjoying it. Also on March 17, uh, we had uh, Teresa Norton. Uh, she is a, uh, a acting coach. In fact, uh, that was a very lively uh, workshop uh, telling our young architects uh, how to present themselves in a presentation. And February 20th, we had uh, the building tour to uh, St. Andrew Church in Jim Sha Joy. That was a wonderful morning on Saturday, and uh, that was um, a fantastic project uh, done by our Nelson Chan, uh, and that was a really, really fantastic uh, building tour. And that starts the 2016, we have a kickoff party uh, at a hotel in Causeway Bay. Everyone was there, and that kicked off the uh, 2016. So, uh, a little bit on the upcoming events. Uh, we have uh, July 28th, we have a technical seminar uh, hosted by Tung Fat Ho, and then on the September 23rd, uh, we have the uh, Meet the Jurors. Uh, on the Design Award Jurors uh, for AI Hong Kong. And then uh, we have the uh, Honors and Award uh, Ceremony and, and Exhibition in PMQ on October 17. And uh, we arrange another two building tours in the coming. One is the Ping An Insurance Tower, which is uh, dubbed the tallest building in southern China. Uh, we will organize a building tour to that in Shenzhen, and also we will tour uh, another uh, new project, the New World Tower in Chim Sa Choi. And on December 1, uh, we will have our annual dinner and our 2016 Design Award presentation. This will be the, um, the highlight and uh, the important events that are uh, coming in the next six months. So, uh, a, a reminder, AI Hong Kong 2016 Honors and Award uh, call for entries. Uh, the deadline is on August 12th. That will be the uh, ceremony that uh, we will announce the winner of the, of the design awards on October 11th. And then the, to present the awards on December 1st. So these are the three key dates. Now I would pass the uh, mic and the podium to Jason. Before I do that, I must thank Jason uh, being so kind and, and, and uh, help me to organize uh, the advanced technology lectures in this year. It's fantastic. Thank you, Jason. Thanks, Ken. Uh, 
really great to see such a large crowd tonight. Um, all excited for a wonderful series of speakers and, and lectures. Um, in, a, in a, I think, quite a rare occurrence in architecture, or uh, in a lecture series of architecture, where the lecture, lectures tonight are not necessarily centered around a single practice, but they're centered around a building. And uh, we have the pleasure of listening to three highly uncoordinated lectures from the architects, coordinated respectively, but not uh, overall. We have uh, Zaha Hadid Architects presenting, we have Bureau Haphold presenting, and we have Front uh, presenting from Hong Kong. The lectures have not been coordinated between firms, so I think what's really exciting is a chance to hear about one of the most innovative buildings and facade systems on the uh, face of the world today being built, due to be completed next year. Um, so we're hearing about an unfinished building in the process of design, analysis, and production uh, from three very different perspectives, the architect, the engineer, and the facade production specialists. So um, we're very interested to uh, hear more about that. Um, thanks to the AIA and to Ken for allowing me to put together a few speakers this year. I'm actually leaving Hong Kong in a couple weeks so the uh, original intention was to have uh, three lecture series, one on the relationship of technology to materials, one on the relationship of technology to production, and one on the relationship of technology to design. So we're cheating a bit in that we're bringing design and technology and analysis together tonight. And I'm very interested to hear the speakers' presentations about the, the role of technology in each of those different facets of an architectural project. Um, I think the, the project is also, or the lecture series is apropos this year, given the very sad passing of Zaha Hadid earlier. Um, this is one of the projects which the firm is carrying out and we're thrilled to see uh, being finished in our own region of Hong Kong, Macau, and the Pearl River Delta. So we're going from design to analysis uh, to production. That's the order of the, the talks tonight. We're going to start with two uh, project architects from Zaha Hadid Architects who have been kind enough to fly all the way from London and are fresh off of the site in Macau. Um, the first presentation tonight will be by Viviana Musketola, Mush Mushketola excuse me, and Michel Salvi, um, who will present the, the building and the project, the history of the project, from the perspective of the architect. Uh, uh, Viviana has been the project director for this 780-room hotel project in Macau and has been the project director for a number of major projects at Zaha Hadid's office um, over the last 12 years. Michelle Salvi is the lead architect specializing in the facade uh, for the project who will um, follow uh, the first talk. Um, he's uh, an expert in parametric design and the, re the role of parametric design to facade systems. Uh, we'll then shift over to our representative, uh, Emilio Piermarini from Bureau Hapold Architects here in Hong Kong, who's the project engineer for the uh, Bureau Hapold office, who will present uh, the, the role that technology played in the analysis of the building. Um, Emilio, who I just met tonight, uh, has a degree from MIT and has been working on a number of complex and large-scale projects with Euro Happold. He's been in Hong Kong now for more than two years. Uh, the final two speakers tonight will be Ramon van der Heiden and uh, Evan Lavelle, who are both associates at Front, Inc. Front is a facade uh, expert uh, or facade consultancy based in, not only in Hong Kong, but in New York, and where else? San Francisco. Uh, thanks to Martin Reese, a director at Front, who's also here, and has uh, had the success of building up one of the most technologically advanced offices in Hong Kong, I, I should say, one that every architect would be thrilled to work with. Uh, Ramon and Evan and I have worked together in the past uh, in the Smart Geometry Conference a couple years ago. 
and they've really made um, a lot of advances in the role of technology and uh, towards production, towards the drafting of thousands, or tens of thousands of working drawings in weeks. So front can beat anyone's uh, tender these days on time. <laughs> um, so we'll, without further ado, I think we'll, we'll kick off the lecture. And I'd like to bring uh, Viviana to the stage to start for Zaha Hadid Architects. Thanks very much. I should, I should say that tonight's presentations are being simulcast to uh, AIA in Shanghai, as well as the uh, Zaha Hadid office and the Bureau Happold office in London. So we have a truly global set of presentations tonight. Thanks very much. the presentation goes up on the screen. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the AIA and Ken and Jason particularly for inviting uh, us, uh, Zadid Architects and myself and Michele, to present this project. It's a project that we have been really proud to be a part of uh, since the beginning. And uh, the, up to yesterday that we went on site with our team, uh, have been an exciting journey, um, especially I would like to talk to you about tonight, not only about the technicality, how, how to deliver such an ambitious project, but how to do it uh, with, by working very closely with all of the people that have been involved in this project. And by that, I don't mean only our engineers, they were great, uh, but uh, the client, uh, Melko Crown, to start with, to having had enough, enough trust on our office to deliver the most iconic new development in Macau. And I would like to thank all of the engineers and all of the executive architects and the architects that have been working uh, alongside with us to be able to you know, deliver this project. And finally, you will see a lot of the, the presentation is about who did the fabrication, who did the effectual, uh, uh, official and final execution of our project. So let's start. I hope it's not going to be too technical, but uh, that you have an overview of how this project went from design to fabrication. So why the fifth hotel? Um, there is not yet a name for this project, so we are still calling it the fifth hotel. Um, I think in, uh, this, this project is, for us, very important. It's one of the first big-scale uh, integrated project hotel. It uh, has been all parametrically designed, uh, but at the same time is the first building uh, that is uh, complete, supported by exoskeleton that our office has done. Of course, there are others. And uh, we have developed uh, throughout the life of the design and then construction of this building a lot of interesting uh, ways of uh, uh, fabricate the final uh, steel and facade that I hope we are going to present tonight and uh, we'll make it clear enough. As I was saying before, there is no uh, great project without a great team at the back. And uh, from Melko Crown to all of this long list of uh, consultants, they all not only did their shift in delivering this project, put a lot of uh, passion into it. So there is a lot of brain. Everyone that participated in this project they put a lot of intelligence, but also a lot of heart in delivering it. So I, I call this project uh, a true example of what you say collaborative intelligence. Is, is our design, is Zahadi, the architect's design, but is the design of all of the people that have been working on this. And um, we're really proud to, to say that it's been an intense work for us. Uh, it was a 24 hours project, since you can see all of the practice were located in different places around the globe. Um, and we have worked on these 24 hours in a sense that while Hong Kong was leaving, London was awake and, and vice versa. We had uh, an amazing team, an amazing support by Zaha, 
uh, herself that, uh, as was mentioned before, passed away a few months ago. Um, she was, of course, a very important person for all of us that have been working for many years at the practice, not only as a mentor to always achieve the best in architecture and deliver the best, but also as a friend, as a person that could mentor us in the architecture world. The office is strong, we are delivering a lot of projects and starting new ones, so you will see more from Zahadid. We will try to keep up uh, the good, uh, the very, very high standard that she taught us, and at the same, same time trying to even exceed, I mean, go forward with it. Um, the project timeline, uh, we started this project at the end of 2012 when uh, Melko Crown contacted us with uh, a very small brief. It was half, an, half of a page and, um, you know, those clients, they know what they want, but they, they knew also that by giving us a lot of freedom, we would have come out with something a little bit out of the box. So the brief was really small at the beginning and then got bigger and bigger and bigger as we moved on. So it was just a, a test on us. Um, and uh, we are now uh, looking at completion uh, next year for all of the external uh, part of the building and opening ceremony uh, in 2018, beginning of 2018. So as I was saying, Zao was very supportive, but we also had the chance to work very closely, with, very closely with Lorenzo on this project. For a great project, you need great visions. Uh, we are there to do the magic, but we need someone that backs us up a lot. And this was Lawrence with uh, his support and his trust in us. Uh, we had um, a fantastic ceremony a couple of years ago to launch the project to the press. Uh, the magic sphere, I don't know what was he doing, some pyrotechnic exercise. And um, and here we are. I mean, uh, Macau. Uh, you are most of you uh, work here or live here in uh, in Hong Kong and know quite well uh, Macau as well. And uh, you know what architecture in Macau looks like. I'm not going to comment. I just want to say, just want to say uh, that um, a lot of the wow effect in Macau is done with a bit of a strange shapes or with lighting effect, a lot of lightings. I mean, we had to, uh, hopefully our building will not shine too much when it's completed, but eventually this is what, what it is. I mean, this is Macau, there's the gaming industry in Macau, and those are the hotels there in Macau. Uh, when we were first approached by, uh, by Lawrence, so we were a little bit uh, worried about this. I mean, how, how are we gonna work into it? And we, of course, we went for initial site visit, also looking at what was around us. Um, and uh, the client presented us what was already up and running, uh, the City of Dream complex. That had been, uh, it's, it's interesting because despite the, all of the other, they're looking at a lot of uh, effect with lighting and with strange shapes. This is quite elegant and simple design. The client, though, had a site, a little, a little corner, a leftover, that was supposed to be their iconic building. And um, we did, I think we did the magic and we are now building it. That was the site when we first started. We're talking about only 100 per 50 meters. So it's quite a small site for the amount of uh, uh, program that they wanted. Uh, we're looking at 780s, um, uh, keys for this hotel uh, and looking at 150,000 square meter worth of uh, program. So if somebody helps me out, I would like to do the trick of uh, playing the video of our building. So again, it tricked us a lot because the brief was this big, but effectively in the side was also this small <laughs> for the amount of program that they wanted inside. So this is one of the videos that we made a little bit along the, the line. I mean, it wasn't the first video. Hopefully there should be also some music. We tried to make it a bit of an entertainment uh, as well. Um, and I first want to give you an overview with the video and then I'm going to explain all of it.
Big noise. of lighting effect we have to give it into the show otherwise <laughs> we cannot be in Macau. Can we go back to the presentation? So this gives you uh, an overview of the project. I, I think what, um, what I'm going to present you right now is how the pro project has been um, conceived right at the beginning. I was talking about the quite tight sides and um, at the beginning, we made a couple of options for the client, and the, the main constraint was that for the amount of uh, uh, area that we had to provide for this building, one option was to give them two very close by uh, uh, towers, and one other was to try to work out with uh, this site in a way that uh, somehow the program was respected, it was kind of uh, straightforward to build, but yet you could find those special moments, uh, both inside and outside, where effectively more than just visiting uh, or staying in, in, uh, in, uh, in an hotel, that would become an experience. This is a bit of a theme for all uh, Zahadid architects. We, our architecture is really looking at how people will experience the space and somehow to engage with the public and uplift their experience as they move through the building. So when we um, worked, uh, the first uh, design idea was to carve out, out of a, a mass of a building, a series of voids. And um, in this street that a lot of medical presenters had an age shape that is good luck for the gaming industry, in reality is not, doesn't, this is uh, not the way we see it. The idea was to create as much as possible spaces in between where the guest room could still happen. Because somehow the only way to achieve 780 keys in this hotel was to allow for the in-between space to still be with view out and an interesting view out. So we have a lot of, uh, let's say, standard in a way guest rooms. We have a lot of special guest rooms uh, and those, I would say, are the one in the middle, the, the one that overlook the voids. The connection in between um, the different, uh, the two towers at the top and at the, sorry, there's a problem with the, this, 
and, and at the bottom is mainly um, left to a program that is uh, open for everyone. So there will be lobby restaurant areas in the two bridges and uh, the rest of it is, uh, is going to be guest rooms. So a common podium, hotel room and the sky top. Of course, it seems that after Marina Bay in the casino you cannot not do a sky pool. I think the idea of the sky pool is very good, brings you up in the sky and somehow in a better environmental position, but also uh, create this contact back to the landscape and to the water higher up in the building. So we are really happy that Marina Says Benz in Singapore opened up this possibility and I think we resolve it quite well with this idea of, again, another void in which our swimming pool will sit in. So, although it looks like a quite uh, elaborate design, um, as you can see, those are the floor plates, are all uh, the typical floors. Uh, the building is actually uh, working with a very um, repetitive floor plate uh, on the two sides, around the two cores. And then, as it moves up, becomes a one gigantic footprint, that is the area of the VIP uh, guest room and, uh, and uh, gaming. So, starting from the approach of the building that is quite constrained, um, we, uh, up, we get uh, throughout the drop-off uh, for the guests into a space that we spend a lot of time to design and to articulate uh, formally because somehow this has, uh, for us, the light, is the lighting effect that you get with other casino. So it's the experience of being inside and outside at the same time, have natural light. It's an almost 40 meter side atrium uh, that uh, has the belly overlooking on the top. There will be those um, panoramic lifts that will cross uh, the entire building and make you experience as you move up all of this space. So we think that, again, um, this game of solid and void in and out of the surface plays enough, is enough to create this uh, sense of special, of wow, that is what uh, our client had in mind and requested us to do. Uh, so some of the visuals, I hope they look right. I mean, Zah would have screamed at me for the quality of the video before. <laughs> Uh, I am still, uh, I mean, I'm trying to better off myself on this, but I can hear her uh, something on my back now. <laughs> and uh, more views of this special space. Right now we are in the lift and we are starting to travel up into the building. So this would be the typical floor plate when the two towers are detached. You have two cores with panoramic lifts crossing the voids you will be able to see outside and uh, as we move up the first bridge starts to appear there's still going to be a void so that vertically there is always a connection back to the lobby space so a nightmare for our uh, fire engineers on this one uh, but we made it uh, got permission for everything and uh, again um, some of the visuals so uh, the, the facade that is part of today's presentation is very close and very far away, depending on where you are, but we, the intent is that somehow is the real, true elements that link uh, this building as you move across. So for us, it was uh, an area of uh, great interest. Coming up, swimming pool, and uh, finally we are on the top of the building. So let's get started with uh, the design to fabrication process. Um, that was the concept design, a little bit too freeform. <laughs> so we went to a next step, a little bit too rigid. I mean, of course, when you start to optimize, sometimes you optimize too much. And this is our uh, final building as it stands, or as it's gonna be built. And we are here, sorry, this is the final design. And we are here today to present how we went from, you know, the initial sketch that was signed off by Melko, but was uh, far off from let's say, being buildable, to the final version of our building. So, the design methodology, this is what a serious topic for tonight, and um, every project has its own constraint, and uh, in this case, uh, we set some constraints by ourselves by choosing quite an ambitious facade, uh, in terms of both uh, structure constraint and fabrication constraint, but of course, there is cost and time that comes into the way of every single project. 
um, the way we work it out, and I put here Zaha Hadid, but you will see that was a collaboration with, uh, of course, Bureau Hapul with uh, Dragage, as, uh, that is now on site 24 hours building this dream for us. And with all of the consultants that be working with that, it was throughout the geometrical rationalization and with the use of parametric tools. Now, what was for us very, very important is that when uh, we were you know, doing our magic and parametric tools in London, we had to be really sure that somebody was following up all the way into fabrication. And all of the fabrication for this building was made here in mainland China. And uh, we are really proud to say that it exceeds every expectation. Um, and uh, the control and the precision that we are seeing uh, on site, uh, it's, it's really great. So this is the, the way we worked with uh, Zahadid, of course, trying to uh, steer up the boat uh, throughout the design process. Uh, but um, the contractor role was very important for us, and finally, the subcontractor and fabricators on site. Uh, here we are, so this is how we move from us to Bureau Hapul, and in this case to Front. Uh, other contractors have been involved in this, but I think it's important that on the facade we go through the, the process in itself. So, First of all, uh, it was our time at the beginning to do the first uh, set, uh, set up the, rule, the rules to rationalize this building, uh, the massing of this building, bring some symmetry in the facade. This is a mirror facade that, of course, saves some time in already in the uh, uh, production of uh, the drawings, the final drawings. And uh, those are the facade components. Today, we are going to look mostly at the exoskeleton steel structure and its cladding. The glazing, we will do another lecture if you invite us again, and we're gonna, uh, and you will enjoy us again for another of two hours to present that part. So the exoskeleton, um, Bureau Hapul, uh, London and Hong Kong have been working very closely with us from day one. Um, we have, of course, a part of the exoskeleton that is the flat facade that is relatively easy to, uh, to, to engineer, but the freeform part, what we call the belly area, is actually the one that we are going to focus our attention more today. Um, talking about rules, I mean, there is no parametric design without rules. And in this case, the rules uh, that seems obvious uh, were to you know, align every single node of this building with the floor, with the beams. So, when you look at those diagrams, uh, of course, we had to do a little bit of test and uh, change, but finally we got it right, both in London and in Hong Kong, and uh, this is the connection we're looking at. Effectively, the exoskeleton is not uh, somebody thing by looking at this building, <clears throat> only, uh, a, uh, let's say, a game that we have played. The exoskeleton is intended to be there with this kind of uh, elaborated uh, pattern to uh, take on the lateral stability of this building. We have the cores, we have the floor plate, and we have the exoskeleton. The inside uh, structure is almost free, and uh, somehow this made um, a big uh, impact on then later on the internal layout for the building. Freeing up from columns uh, with the exoskeleton was a decision that we made, and uh, we had to make it work though structurally with, uh, with our engineers. So, of course, the process uh, has a lot of test and uh, try. And for the flat facade was simple. Already when it starts to curve into the belly, we had to apply a certain number of rules. And um, this, uh, in, you, you don't do it just once, you do it millions of times. And the best thing to do if you start from the beginning to set up some some parametric tools to work it out uh, all the way. So here is the first one that we did. We went to the, from the freeform facade to a faceted facade. And again, um, Bureau Apple came back to us because we worked really closely throughout the process and start to work out how this model was actually behaving structurally. So how uh, actually the, the, the structure is, of course, thicker at the base and lighter on the top. And how, those set of rules informed us with yet another set of uh, 
um, let's say, a reiteration of parametric uh, scripting in our practice. So, mm, for as much as we liked it, uh, the structural member uh, section had to be constant, and we had to find a way in this quite freeform shape to uh, build it uh, in a way that every single member was respecting this rule. So we worked out the geometric constraint, the rules again. We did a, a small test in an area, but then we really needed the powerful, um, let's say, um, uh, the, the power of our engine back to the office to be able to go from you know a, a small test to the overall uh, building of, of each one of those members. Zadid is not doing structure. We're not um, structure engineers. But we work with our structure engineers very closely. And uh, what we cared was not much about how the structure was behaving, but that the final uh, clubbing that you see now in red was respected. So we wanted to make sure that our envelope, the final result that the client would have uh, signed up for us, was exactly what we designed for. And to be able to do that, we had to go through step by step with Bureau Apple to set up those axes. Later on, you will have a great presentation of how each one of those nodes was designed. So I'm going to go uh, and pass this one to the, um, the next presenter after to go more in detail. Finally, I mean, all of those software, they talk to each other. So the steel contract, of course, Bureau Apple and then the steel contract were able to uh, to deliver uh, to the client the final calculation of us. Uh, what we had to do is to make sure that while producing the, the inner core of the structure, uh, let's say that the, the constraint were in place for our final result that was the cladding. So some pictures, those are yet a little bit old. We weren't on site yesterday, but this is how the exoskeleton structure looks like. It will be cladded at the end, and you will see it in our presentation. Many workers uh, working very, uh, I mean, again, dragage and big. Uh, they are doing a great job in making this uh, design possible. J this is only to give you a bit of a scale of the node size. And um, I'll leave it to Michele, also <laughs> without voice anymore, uh, to present the cladding uh, of the exoskeleton. And uh, hope we can speed it up. Sorry, it was too long. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> Good evening, everyone. So I'm going to show you something on the cladding, which has been one of the most challenging. Can you hear me? Yeah. One of the most challenging part of this project. Uh, the shape, as you can see, is quite ambitious. And we have a quite big amount of cladding. We have 57,000 uh, square meter of cladding on the overall building. And 12,000 of them are actually doubly curved. So um, the scope of the cladding have been split between two different contractors. And we have um, Aisley contractor, which is taking care of the flat facade, and Kiotech and front uh, for, the, for the freeform area. Uh, as you can imagine, uh, there is an interface uh, between these two contractors. And this part has been quite difficult, because uh, the flat facade responds to certain constraints and the free form has some other constraints. So the substructure inside is completely different. The system design of the cladding is completely different, but on the outside, they look exactly the same, and we are very happy of the result we are having on site. Um, <clears throat> the exoskeleton is subdivided uh, in different families, um, following the tapering of the structure from the bottom to the top of the building, uh, also, the cladding is following and is tapering according to the structure, trying to get as much as, mar, as, mar, as, mar as possible uh, the thinner uh, on envelope as possible. And there are some tapering member between different families, which are matching between two different families. Uh, this is a sketch uh, of how the section in different family works, and you can see with the uh, uh, maybe. 
So yes, uh, this axis in red is the, the axis of the structure, which is parallel to the facade, and the cladding is tapering at the top. It's, there is more distance between the glass and the cladding at the top of the building. Uh, there have been a big work of rationalization, uh, as Viviana was mentioning before, and on the flat facade, we have achieved as much as very, very uh, big amount of flat surfaces. Uh, there are uh, a few panels which are singly curved at the nodes, and uh, even smaller amount of uh, uh, ruled surfaces at the, at the chamfer in the nodes. There are 22 families only uh, for, the, for these curves, so the fillet at the nodes on the overall building are only 22 families, which is quite a big success. Um, and this is what we have on site now. <coughs> uh, the cladding is under installation now, and flat facade. Uh, this part of the building, as you can imagine, has been a bit more or less of a challenge uh, in terms of rationalization. We wanted to get the same result as in flat facade. They had to be coordinated between each other, of course, in terms of aesthetical result. And we, we have worked a lot in terms of parametrical script. This is the script, the, the grasshopper definition that uh, Miro Mutiaba, our architect, who has taken care of this, uh, has developed all the way through different stages of the project. And we have changed this script uh, millions of times, as you can imagine. And at the end of the day, we are very proud to see that you can click and the day after everything is coming out in a single shot. <laughs> the day after, it takes quite a lot. Uh, um, during the history of the project, there have been uh, different setting out between, uh, I mean, different setting out for the cladding in relation to the structure. This is the first attempt. Uh, where the, the cladding was trying to follow the shape of the structure. Uh, of course, we had a, a constraint for the structural engineer, uh, and the structure has to be a uh, square section. So we had tried to follow the structure, but we ended up uh, to have uh, the distance between the cladding and the glazing. This line is representing the glass. Uh, is always variable uh, when you cut the member in different, uh, in different areas. So the next step have been um, uh, changing to uh, uh, the structure to follow the cladding to avoid uh, the complexity uh, that we would have got in this part in the previous version in the node. Uh, but of course, this was a bit of a challenge for these guys, <laughs> the structural engineers. <laughs> so there have been a compromise between. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So this is the final version where we have a kind of hybrid uh, between uh, uh, the complexity of the cladding, which is not actually complexity at the end of the day, has been rationalized, and, and the internal part of the structure, which is a uh, square section. As you can see, the distance between the cladding and the glass is constant everywhere, all the way through the member. Uh, this, this sketch is representing uh, the, the general setting out. Uh, the mean plane that Viviana was showing before in one slide, uh, which is this dashed line in red, uh, is a plane where the exoskeleton uh, structural member is, is aligned with. So the member is flat, I mean, is laying on a flat plane and is singly curved. Uh, the side panel of the cladding uh, is an offset of this mean plane, the so-called mean plane that we always mention. Uh, so this has been a, a, a big success in terms of rationalization because uh, all this part is completely flat, flat uh, all the way through the freeform area. Uh, so we have got a lot of flat panels. Uh, the front panel and the back panel is still doubly curved and the chamfer panels as well. Uh, there have been a lot of tests uh, of rationalization. Uh, this one is an, an attempt we have done uh, uh, two years ago, trying to get rid as much as possible of doubly curved uh, panels. We wanted to rationalize to um, singly curved, cylindrical or conical panel. 
but we ended up to have uh, um, uh, the problem at the edge between different panels because we had a deviation between the joints. Oh, sorry. Can you hear me? Yeah, sorry. Uh, so at the end of the day, we didn't go with this rationalization, and the final geometry is exactly as it was at the beginning coming from our script. So uh, the, the orange and red part is completely doubly curved, and the only flat area are the sides, as I showed before, uh, the part in green, with a few uh, fillets, which are cylindrical. Uh, this is just to anticipate what probably uh, Ramon and Eva will show later. So I'm going to shift this one. A few images uh, of the installation progress inside. This is a part of the flat facade. Uh, a singly curved node, which, uh, which this is the, the rows of nodes we have at the corner of the building. Uh, and this is one of the most complex nodes which have been installed on site a few months ago. Uh, and now the progress uh, is, is going ahead. Uh, you can see in this image uh, uh, the, the result of this uh, big work of rationalization. Um, each member has been subdivided in four portions or two portions depending on, on, on the length. And there are uh, movement joints between the nodes and the member to allow the movement of the structure and different families of joints uh, everywhere else. Uh, this is quite interesting because it's showing how the exoskeleton cladding, the exoskeleton structure is supporting the, the triangulated facade that we have at the back uh, in the central part of the building. Uh, we don't have slabs uh, in, in the freeform area. So the glazing is completely supported by this element from the exoskeleton. Uh, the fabrication. The fabrication has been uh, another big challenge. <coughs> um, uh, on the experience we have got on, on, on different projects, this is a building we have done in Beijing, uh, and another one in Korea, um, we, we have tested different solutions to uh, fabricate complex panels this is a double curve panel that in this case have been molded by this machine. Uh, we have tried to apply this principle to our building, but this is what we ended up to get because the machine is very small and the maximum size we could get is 2 meter by 1.5. So we would have got a quite in control, uncontrolled pattern of joints with our huge nodes. So we, we had to go for something else. So we have studied uh, with, with the contractors uh, different, different methods. This is the first attempt we have done in 2014. Uh, the result is quite bad and there were a lot of bumpiness in the, in the double curve panels and the joints were quite bad because the, the panels were not matching at all. Even if from the distance it looks nice and closer, <laughs> it's quite a bit of a mess. It didn't pass. It was completely rejected. Uh, but it was very helpful because it helped us to understand how to further uh, uh, yeah, to go ahead with this fabrication. Uh, so next step, uh, we have implemented with the contractor the, the aluminum mold that I'm going to show you after. And in this case, uh, we have improved uh, the bumpiness, which is not there anymore, but we still have some problem at the edges of the panel because they were quite irregular and cut by hand somehow. So, uh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> uh, so the contractor came out with this uh, solution, uh, which is a CNC uh, machine, which is able to cut the panels always perpendicular to the edge, which is always in a different uh, direction. And the cut is informed by uh, the computer and is coming directly from our Rhino 3D model. Uh, so after that, finally, we have got uh, a very nice mock-up, approved with comments, not completely happy about it, but it was quite good. <laughs> uh, yeah, and these are a few uh, 
stages of, of the fabrication and I'm going to go through quite quickly. Uh, the first one uh, is the production of the mold, which is coming directly from, from the geometry of our 3D model. There is a perpendicular grid of aluminium panel. Uh, and on top of this model, uh, on top of this mold, um, I mean, after molding the panel, we, we cut the panel. I mean, sorry, I come back. This is the mold. We cut the panel from a flat sheet uh, with this CNC uh, uh, machine. After cutting, we bend the panel by this rolling machine, trying to get as much as possible uh, the curvature of the final, uh, the final element, which is not possible, of course, to be done by hand this way. Uh, we only get the final shape by welding the panel on top of the mold. After welding, uh, we come back to this machine and we cut the edges and, and then we check uh, the deviation, which in this case is very, very small, only two millimeters on top of this panel, which is almost two meters by five. Uh, then we do the stiffeners at the back of the panels, uh, we bend the substructure and we, we uh, I mean, we, the fabricators actually. <laughs> uh, we, they, they fix the substructure at the back of the panel when the panel itself is still uh, welded on top of the mold. This way we can guarantee that the shape is still there and is not going to deform in a different way. Uh, and this is the final panel. Uh, a quite important stage in the fabrication is the pre-assembly in the factory. Each node and each member have been pre-assembled in order to double check that the deviation at the joints uh, is within uh, the, the acceptable uh, ranges that you have has set up. Uh, then the panels are sent to the painting factory and then they are delivered on site. Uh, during this big process of fabrication, uh, we have used CNC sheen, but mostly we have used this kind of tools which are quite standard uh, tools that you can see. Uh, this is just a slide to show how many, how many different tools we have used. And yeah, then I'm going to show you some side progress and I pass the microphone to Miviana again. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, the, yeah, sorry. Yeah, they get over here. I'm going to scream in the... I just want to quickly close this. I mean, the essence of this project is that uh, despite the complexity, if the engineers and the designers, they do their homework in the right way, uh, back in their own office and all, all together, uh, this building that uh, is uh, showing quite high level of uh, ambitious design can be built, can be built on site quite quickly. We are really, really happy about the work that we are seeing right now. Uh, and our big thanks is not only to us as designers, and there are many in this room, but all of the people that are working 24 hours to make the city of dreams fifth hotel reality. So big thanks to all of them. And uh, to all of you for being us with us. Uh, and uh, I'll leave it to Ramon. I hope we've been quick enough on this. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you to Viviana and Michele for that uh, really inspiring overview of the building. And I think tonight there'll be um, some productive overlaps in content uh, between, between each of the, the different perspectives on the building. So to continue the discussion, let's bring up Emidio uh, Pier Marini from Bureau Happel. Thanks, Emidio. Thanks, Jason. Really, really yelling into it. That shouldn't be a problem. That's never been a problem for me. Uh, so one of the things that Jason just said was well, there is a lot of overlap and uncoordinated overlap. But equally, he said something very important at the beginning, which is this is an exoskeleton that can be very easily argued is the most complicated structural exoskeleton on the face of the planet. And I hope as we go through this, you can see why we're saying that. 
And tonight, what we're going to be talking about, got it, uh, is the exoskeletal connection, connection design. So these were steel connections for a structural exoskeleton that is very complicated geometrically and structurally. We'll be going through this story, which is a great case study in how to use our latest and greatest fun tools of parametric technology in the right way. So there's so many stories to talk about in this job, and we only have three up here tonight and a few other players that can't join us on the stage. And for Bureau Happold, we had a lot of stories. As Viviana had said, we were involved in all stages of the structural and facade design. And here in Hong Kong, we actually did the internal and exoskeleton connections, all of which had incredible stories. Tonight, just the exoskeleton connections. So the structure, they've done a great job for me. I don't actually have to get into a lot of this stuff now because we accidentally overlap. Um, as Viviana alluded to, it's a dual structural system where we have two cores holding up the building laterally and gravity system as well as the exoskeleton. So these two systems are coupled and this is not just a striking piece of architecture, it is a piece of engineering as well that you see. But we know we have significant forces going through this exoskeleton. Now, one of the other things is because it is offset from the edge beams and it is tied into the core, this does complicate load paths quite a bit. So on day one, you do have to work with your architect and know exactly what the engineering challenges will be and recognize when to take care of them. One of the things that we were appointed to do in London was to optimize the exoskeleton. This is actually a very efficient structure. And our colleagues in London actually did employ parametric technologies to be able to get this, this pretty picture up here. And what it's showing you is they dipped into a bunch of different types of sections as well as high grade steel to allow us to have slender members that worked really hard, providing the client with a lot of value on the savings in steel. So we're starting small, big and going small. Once again, you guys have just seen this uh, on Viviana's slides. Uh, and what we realized at day one was this was the what we're playing with. We're inside an in aluminum cladded, cladded uh, structure, and this is what we're going to be operating with. And as she alluded to, we knew we had to decide between a warped section and a single curvature section. Now, what she didn't tell you is the reason on why we went that way. Because when you look at this structure, you know it's going to be hard to build. And the picture up top is actually way harder to build than the one on the bottom. So it was all about managing complexity. Where is the complexity best kept? So when we made this decision, it didn't eliminate the complexity, it reduced it. So what happened? Well, for us, we got nice little things like this to deal with now. And for front, they have to worry about a lot of different pieces. So linking us together, there was reasons for this. And early on, we recognized that this is what you're going to be looking at. In every location, necessarily, the geometry would drive what the connection would look like and therefore make for an engineering problem that has never been done on this size and scale before. And that's where we are right now with the challenge. These are the four steps for all of the 2,500 exoskeleton nodes that we had to do a full detailed design on. So every one of these steps, I can't stress enough, on its own is actually a huge task. But on one project with the time scale that we had, immense. And that's why we're here tonight to talk about it. It's very, very special to us. So let's go through it real quick. You're an engineer. So you sit down right away and you go, what's the engineering problem behind this? Why are we here to talk about the engineering? Well, this is a level of complex stress state and other issues that deal with engineering that you don't normally get into. You normally try and avoid it as much as possible. But on this job, as you'll see, we had to deal with these things and whip out our best tool, our most accurate tool, finite element analysis, on the grandest scale that you could actually have it and delve into force mapping and big data sort of processing that most engineers never will touch in their whole career. And you're on your heels on the first day. You're on your heels. But it doesn't stop there. That's just the engineering. There's other constraints on this job that are extraordinary. The architectural and fabrication constraints don't stop. We're having to be very adept with dealing with a very complicated exoskeleton cladding system and not clashing with it. And at the same time, knowing that, we don't know who the contractor is going to be in China. And we are specifying some of the highest grade plate on some of the thickest plate that you're going to use on a civil structure. And you're going to have to document all of this for him somewhere you don't know what he's capable of. You have to have all this mastered at the front end of things. So taking another step back, you're getting hit again. And finally, time 
we all know time is the biggest thing we had a twelve month program but because the first three months that was necessarily used to innovate and come up with a new tool which will be talking about tonight you had nine months at the end of it now for the actual practicing engineer that actually means that every day for nine months four hours at a time you have to have something that's ready to go out the door that's day one so I hope that gives you a little bit of background exactly what we were looking at and why this is such an awesome challenge to be working on let's go through each one of these a little bit clearer so step number one find similar nodes now why do we do this because to do this this actually allows us to divide our work and this happens on every job so what will normally happen is you go around you kind of look and you look what has the same geometry and what has the same um, so if, if my arms were the connection if it was a four member cross it has to have the same orientation and also the same sections coming into it now this is usually very easy to pick up but I challenge anybody in this room right now to look at this image and be able to tell exactly which ones can adopt the same connection detail very hard to do and actually even if it has the same geometry that you can see here on this diagram how do you know it has the same section remember we did a nice optimization algorithm to save the client money so right away you're hit with a very very interesting problem because this not only helps us it helps the fabricator as well to reduce the amount of unique work to do and modularize things now meeting constraints Viviana kind of got involved in this a little bit already so we'll bounce through this this is what Zaha gave us this is the envelope that we knew this was our playground and we're playing every time 2500 times something awesome like this some crazy geometry problem that play changes it every time there is no book to solve a problem like this and you recognize that the geometry that is already there has been clash detected against her envelope ah by you yeah but not that one but not that one you did afterwards though. <laughs> so you know that you're stepping outside of the bounds of that envelope or that checked member already from day one you know you're doing that so you know that you need to be very adept in working in three dimensions usually this is something that you don't have to do so working in three dimensions you might scheme up something like this the little red man standing next to the node here this is something that works architecturally ah but we also got to be able to build this just as fast as we designed it and we don't know who's going to be doing that so on paper before you even pick up your pencil you better know that whatever you specified can be built so if you have to do it in 3d you do it in 3d and the cool part starts now for us engineers now we get to start throwing forces on it and actually analyzing silence uh, so basically 70 mega newtons for those of you who don't remember your structures that's a big deal and having 20 mega newtons cranked in eccentricity on the back that's a big deal and that's what we knew right away the engineering challenge was going to be amazing now given that we are sort of uh, a mixed group of people on technical levels we're going to make an analogy I hope you like it okay so usually in the UK and the United States this kind of a job wouldn't even go to an engineer record it would go to a subcontractor of the contractor we give them the forces he'd go away and design the connections based on those forces using his connections bulldozer okay and what is his connections bulldozer it's something like this it's a codified approach it's very tried and true and he's very used to that that's your 99 percent of jobs right there okay but when your bulldozer fa fails you well first of all why do why do you use your bulldozer fail you uh, first of all on the left here you can see a typical case a typical 99 percent of the cases of the buildings you have simple force transfer through your connection now what happened on city of dreams a little bit different because of the insane geometry you had to have more complex connections which by their very nature transfer more forces you can see more red on the right than on the left and because of that it disqualified you from using these methods so tool number one off the list tool number two is a shovel well when your bulldozer doesn't work get down and dirty start using your shovel so what is that in connection design terminology that's bespoke hand calculations now what is this it's a little bit more refined of a process but it's actually going away knowing your engineering technology knowing the actual theory and math and physics behind things how things work and go and chug plug in and chug in numbers problem with this why this was not able to be used this word right here assumptions 
Every step of these calculations is actually a very conservative assumption. And in general, it can be very useful. But if you have to do it for equations that are very complicated by their nature. So I get to look fancy now and throw up some very fancy plots up here like we're in college again. But when you have the complex stress state that we had, this is actually the realm of stress that you're dealing in. And you do not want to be playing with that equation by hand. So you'll make conservative assumptions. And that, as we'll show you, actually leads to a huge amount of materials being wasted. So two tools, one more left in the toolbox. And that is the archaeological tools that you hardly ever have to resort to getting down on your hands and knees, finite element analysis. And what does this look like in real terms? Nice, pretty stress plots that we had to mass produce. And this is by far our most powerful tools as structural engineers in the modern era. And you look at me and you say, Medio, then why don't you use it on everything? If it saves material and it's so powerful, why aren't we doing this all the time? The problem is, is just like those archaeological tools, they take time to set up, and they're very esoteric to process and run and understand. And you can actually get really stupid results if you're not paying attention. So that is the reason why all of these things together prevented us from using the, the previous tools. So if I can bring home the analogy here, we knew from day one, because of the analysis, we had to use our scalpel. But because of the massive amounts of nodes and the time constraints, we'd have to be doing the amount of work that we normally save for a bulldozer. So that is where we were on day one on this job. We knew that this was going to be a very special analysis in terms, and with everything else, an immense task. And just to show you guys what the effect of this scalpel is, remember, this is a pretty picture right now. This is what we come up. It works with the architectural envelope. Can we ever, everybody look at this plate right here, this peach plate? Now, that's what that actually looked like when you put forces on it. That is with your scalpel. That is the best case scenario. Imagine what it would look like if you weren't using your scalpel. <laughs> yeah, Terrence, right? <laughs> so basically, that in a nutshell is the challenge of structural analysis on such an insane, complicated geometry. And there it is. You had shown it too. This is our favorite node apparently on the project for all parties. We called it the mega node internally. So. Um, so yeah, there she is in the sky. And finally, document. It's just she. It's like a ship. Like, you know. <laughs> and finally, documentation. Everybody's using different softwares, but one thing's for sure. How on earth do you document and portray your thoughts and ideas on something like this 2,500 times? How do you do it? That is the challenge. Okay. This is one of the things that's very important to understand. All of these on their own are very, very big things for engineers to take care of. There's no book for this. And because there's no book for this, we had to make our own solution. Like I said, the first three months of this program was dedicated towards developing a parametric solution that would help us on all 2,500 exoskeleton nodes. And I can't stress this enough. One of the big points I want to get across tonight is this was not a tool that drove us. We drove this tool. This tool acted as an extension of our engineering minds and is a good example in not letting technology overcome, be the, the designer. You are the designer. You always will be. One of the examples I can show you here of this is uh, if you look at this video, uh, this is showing us in real time, everything else is sped up tonight, but this video is real time, managing the amounts of data and the different, uh, different factors that we had to keep track of throughout the whole process. So this is real time, going through, seeing what things would look like, managing data, bringing things up, and understanding your engineering mind comes first. And you just need to present this data in front of it. And you'll come up with some pretty cool ideas, as you'll see. And of course, all of this is going right back to our favorite scalpel tool, finite element analysis, this tool we know we're going to have to use on the City of Dreams. So one at a time, how do we use this grasshopper tool to do determining unique connections? Well, like I said before, if you had a four-member cross, example of my arms here, and you knew that basically for that thing to have the same connection uh, at different locations for a four-member cross, it has to have the same angles between your, between your members and also the same sections coming in. Luckily for us, Grasshopper's hooked up to Rhino. Rhino knows all that information. So why don't we just develop something with all these different parameters in there that will actually highlight where this is. So there's no mental gymnastics as far as where we think there's going to be similar connections. 
This is not much unlike what Google Car is doing these days where they're actually teaching a computer to see what another car is, uh, see what cones are, see what traffic signals are, even see what human beings look like. This is now part of our industry, something that you have to be able to teach a computer what's going on. Now, we, do we just, was that it? Did we just press a button and after that we had a connection? Absolutely not. Just like Google Car, you would never actually let a computer make that decision if the similar node was there. You have checks and balances in place, no mental gymnastics. It tells you right there, this is XYZ. Whatever information you want to know, it's right there. And you can be the judge of, is this really going to be a similar detail? Once again, control. The engineer is in control. Now, meeting constraints, architectural and fabrication constraints. How did we do it? I think uh, Viviana hit, hit on before, or no, Michele hit on before. When you look at the building, obviously the, the middle freeform area is where it all comes together and it's really the most complicated version. So we're going to focus on this for this little case study. So if you look at this, what I'm doing right now is using, I'm using my script to show you the typical case of what we were up against. This mess of steel that no one in the world has a book to solve. And we said at the beginning, before any analysis, whatever solution we come up with has to be modular, easy to build, and architecturally flexible. So I give you the tin can detail. This was one sheet of details given to the fabricator in China for all, all, all of the freeform section nodes. They all adopted this detail. Now why did we do this? Because first, it's easy to build. Anybody can build this, no complaints whatsoever. The second reason is it's architecturally very flexible. This line right here is a fold line which allows us, as you'll see in the demonstration, to maintain planar plates for all of the connection details to keep things simple, but while staying in curved and warped envelopes that we had to stay inside of. It was this flexibility in the definition that allowed it to be used everywhere. And because it's a rule, as they said before, if it's a rule you can script it, and boy we did. Uh, so this is me using the tool right now on live on the job. So we would actually come in, use our engineering minds to say, all right, well, what's this tin can going to look like? What's it kind of going to be ish? And then we're going to reference that geometry into Grasshopper with our magnificent script and use that as a tool to explore this design space. Now, this design space, like I said, is constrained by architectural and fabrication constraints. And you'll see how quickly we're actually able to go through an infinite, what is an infinite amount of solutions. Right away, that came up. Grasshopper did the heavy lifting, and I can see I have two problems. A, I'm clashing with Michele and Viviana's envelope, and you guys aren't happy with me right now. What I'm about to do next make me even more angry. We don't have enough edge distance here. So I'm going to use my fancy tool to actually raise the lid of this uh, can and give them more edge distance. They're going to need that on site. But as you can see, everybody, front, Zaha, they're, they're like, what are you doing? Like, you're clashing with it. Uh, and luckily for us, we had that crank line installed. So what we did, as we said, pretend this is the top of the lid, and my hands are the crank line. What we're going to do is just crank away from the top. And that's what you see here. You can actually see the crank line now. And as I play with this slider, it actually goes away. Now this is all sped up, like I said, but this is not sped up more than about 50%, which means that there is no such thing on this project as give it to the computer, the computer will design it for you. It's a, hey, listen, go through it yourself, like figure out what's best, because there's way too many parameters to sit in here and actually have to give it to a computer to do. Nothing can beat you in your design mind. And now we get to do the fun part, finite element analysis. So I know we don't want to get too much in, too technical tonight, so I made a nice little video a few weeks ago. I hope you enjoy it. This is a one-to-one -one controlled experiment. We've tried to keep this as technical as possible. On the top, you have uh, myself doing hand calculations. On the bottom, you have me using the actual grasshopper tool for City of Dreams. And you're going to see that there is a huge difference between using your scalpel and using your shovel. So at the top, this guy is actually going through and he's just sketching things out. He's copying down data from the computer screen and he's trying to come up with how this connection is going to work. Now he's mm, about 10 minutes in. These two things are exactly the same, same time scales. And like I said before, we don't normally use this tool because it takes a long time to set up. But we're 10 minutes in and it's already almost done. 
So this is the thing. It's night and day difference using this tool versus before, even if you were already just kind of using this one down here. So 15 minutes in, no one, this guy's actually ran his first scalpel model. So he's using the most high grade form of analysis that's available on the planet. He's already using that. The guy up top hasn't even started chucking around numbers yet. And remember what I said before, every line that you see him drawing right now is a conservative assumption. He's amassing a bunch of steel that doesn't actually need to be used. It's conservative because he has time constraints. He has to try and bounce through this pretty quickly. So there is this balance that he has to strike. Whereas on the bottom, this guy's doing another analysis and he's using the scalpel as it's best used. Hey, let's run it once and see actually where we need to invest material in such that this thing stands up but is economical. And 25 minutes in, he's done. Whereas the other guy, not so much. 50 minutes in, he's done one out of 10 plates on this connection, which is obviously unacceptable when you have to have four hours to get one out of the door. Not just the analysis, the whole thing's gotta be gone. Not only that, he used a lot of material. You can see in this image right here the difference between using method A and method B. It's a factor of three for materials. And not only that, you actually change the design intent that you start off with. This magenta, using the shovel, using the hand calculations, is actually now so thick you might as well just cast the structure, cast the node and put it on the structure. So we're talking night and day differences in accuracy and levels of efficiency. And finally, documentation. How did we document all of this? Now we knew from day one there was no way possible that neither us nor the contractor had the site of resources on this program to take something in 3D and then take it down to 2D, shift it over, and then put it back up to 3D. Impossible. All the steps, huge amounts of error that would come in, we couldn't do that. So we had all this stuff parametrically defined in 3D space. We throw in a little bake button, and there you go. You can have it in 3D space and allow yourself to do a final clash detection test, make sure everything looks right, and then why bring that down to 2D? Send it over to him. So we agreed with him. We'll send you digital information for all of the setting out for the freeform nodes. We can't put this on drawings. It doesn't make sense for anybody. And as Viviana had showed you before, this has ended up with a nice little piece of work. This is what they got. That and the one detail we had up there before was all they received. And because of that, because it was a modular solution, because it was something that was very above board in three dimensions, very low ambiguity with three dimensions, it was going very, very well. There's been very few uh, contractor queries, very low confusion, and it's all gone together like a dream. And speaking of the reality of things, I have a video too from the site. <laughs> we all love to see this site because it is something to behold. Uh, you're in the elevator, lift, sorry, uh, of the <laughs> American. Uh, you're going up in the, uh, the site, and you can see all the things that are going on right now. The one thing that is noticeable is there's just a mountain of steel out there. And it's amazing to see that you can see the macro panels going up. If you pay attention right here, hey, how you doing? There's one of our exoskeleton nodes. Uh, this is the uh, bridge. We're going into the bridge area where Viviana was talking about, the one that goes between the cores where the restaurant will be. And it's just so impressive to see how much work the contractor has had to put in to making a building to make our building. You just don't see this anymore. It kind of reminds you of back in the good old days of structural engineering when you used to see things like this, where you would actually have to do such a thing. You don't see this anymore. And you certainly don't see it for your connections, but we did. Uh, this is uh, a little jig they had to make just to make one of our connections. Uh, and it really, like I said, this, this task is immense. And the size of it really drives it home. I mean, even the small connections that we're talking about in this job, we gave them little nicknames sometime. This one was the kite, okay? Even the small ones are bigger than you and I. And I think, uh, I think I'd like to end on this little game that we like to play sometimes. Can anybody spot Waldo? How you doing? There he is. He's about to get eaten by a, a bear claw there. It's really cool to see stuff like this on site. You're like, oh, good, good God, that's, that's really cool. And uh, it just that drives it home. When you actually see it there on site and you realize that is, that is something you don't get to see. This is the 0.001% of jobs for something like this. So that's all we have for you here today. Um, thank you for having us, seriously. <laughs> 
And just one thing, in our industry, we are always going to have new technologies being rolled out. And there's always going to be a button that comes up and they say, oh, this button now does your job for this. This button now does your job for that. This button is going to replace you. Do we believe that? This is actually an exercise in that right there, that we did not let the computer take over the design process. And I hope that's been readily apparent, is that this was an extension of our design minds. Thank you very much. I suddenly want to become a uh, structural engineer. <laughs> I hope, Amelia, you brought plenty of business cards tonight. And I think we're going to double the uh, continuing education credits for all the AIA members in the audience um, to shift on from design and analysis into production. I'd like to uh, welcome uh, Ramon van der Heiden and Evan Lavelle from Front. All right, well, I guess I'll keep it close. So that was a lot of enthusiasm, so I don't know if I can follow that, but I'll, I'll certainly try. Um, so let this guy get full, and um, we'll get underway. All right, cool. Um, so we had a very, very specific scope. Um, we're just, we were tasked with uh, assisting the facade contractor in designing and sort of documenting the exoskeleton freeform cladding. Uh, okay, there we go. Um, so a little bit about us, if you don't know, just really quick. Uh, we're a facade consulting firm who had the opportunity of working with the best architects, owners, and contractors in the world. And we've uh, been around for about 15 years. A lot of big projects, a lot of complex projects. Um, and uh, luckily, we have a pretty big global presence with uh, about 150 built works across the planet. So um, that kind of leads us to what we call an interesting problem. Um, so we were brought on by Keotech uh, late November 2014. Um, Keotech was the facade contractor of the freeform cladding area, which is the area in the middle. Uh, they were responsible for the uh, uh, flat cladding, or kind of semi-flat cladding, the macro windows, and the uh, what we were responsible for is the freeform cladding. And we were introduced to, introduced to project with about, you know, very, very scant on the details. You know, floor seven to 36, approximately 18,000 square meters of surface area, maybe 20,000, maybe more panels. Most of the cladding is double curve. We're looking about 67% of the area. Expect no repetition. Uh, very, very large loads and uh, extremely large panels, 10 square meters, a, a bedroom. Uh, so, well, you know, our, our scope is very, Surgical, let's use the scalpel uh, analogies using uh, So we were interpret the design intent, do all the engineering, fill it with a bunch of stuff, draw everything, tell someone how to put, put it together, and tell them where it goes. That was it. Um, and to do that, we basically got four things. Uh, we had the envelope model from the architect, the orientation model, which the mean planes, which is the deal breaker on this project. The primary structural from Bureau Happold uh, and the design specification also from Bureau Happold. Sort of combining these things, we uh, sort of construct our, our little thing. Um, so very broadly, I think we've already touched on some of these, we had some interesting constraints. Uh, just an in, insanely variable and a very tight relationship to the primary structure. Uh, it, it, it just follows. Uh, you have to follow along. Um, and you can kind of see the scale of it. Uh, we took one section through every member and it's just uh, sort of um, un unprecedented variability. Um, and again, early design process, there was no fabricator. Um, it wasn't selected yet. So we, we were looking all the way from uh, very, very small panels, 1.4 meter by 1.4 to, uh, you know, functionally 2 meter by 5 meter panel. We were, had to think about a system that could accommodate uh, that available variability early on and adapt to whenever a contractor was picked we could throw whatever we were going at it. Um, again, highly high wind loads and very complex building movements. They have this very uh, wonderful primary structure that moves an insane amount and it moves in very, very complex ways. And <laughs> we were tasked like, hey, you figure out how to not make the cladding break as this thing moves. Um, so that was a very interesting task. 
Uh, again, we, again, we would do our due diligence and we looked at rationalization strategies. And as McKelly mentioned, it's 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 an, it's already rationalized as much as we can. So we looked at you know multiple cone strategies. We looked at uh, uh, um, you know uh, inclined cylinders, and we looked at uh, 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 you know as an entire surface or a multi-surface. And again, you would it would require you to reset out the entire cladding uh, if you didn't do it as a double curve panel. Um, so again. It was nice to do that, but we could throw that out and said, okay, we're doing everything with full curve. Uh, and just the scale uh, was enormous. We had, um, again, 18,000 square meters, almost 190,000 square feet of uh, cladding. We ended up with roughly 25,000 panels, uh, 18,500 connections back to the primary structure, you know, one point, nearly 1 1.7 million parts, uh, you know, five and a change million fasteners, and about 137,000 linear meters of extrusions uh, just to support this cladding. Um, so then <laughs> kind of get into the design a little bit. And uh, for us, design is not merely about, uh, you know, designing whatever system you can do or whatever model you can do. It's, it's really looking at design as a process. And so we like to think about this project and most things we do is how do we design this process to take something inherently very complex distill it down to the most basic part, distribute that part to hundreds or thousands of individual actors who will again assemble this, and then provide a set of uh, clear instructions to enable those people to take those really simple parts, put them back together, and then rebuild the complexity. Um, and that was kind of the main design challenge for us in how we structured all of the sort of work on this project. Uh, so again, it's use a kit of simple profiles and parts, try to find stock stuff, try to find very simple things, and what this allows you to do is uh, create very rational parts, create, uh, again, fabrication drawings that only use single planar cuts or single curvature. Uh, so there's, there's just no complexity in the individual components that allows you to, you know, any supplier can make this. Uh, again, it's, you, you're, you don't know who's going to make it, so you need to develop a system that will allow anybody to make this. And again, that's sort of part of your Haffold's very important strategies uh, with doing this. Um, you got to scale tens of thousands of conditions. You have to uh, develop a system that will, and documentation process and a thinking process that will allow you to do that. Uh, you need to be able to describe everything in as many different mediums as possible. And we try, in most cases, that everything will degrade very gracefully to just text. Uh, you can describe anything in just text. And this allows you to create very uh, complex relational databases and uh, um, very fast queries on very, very large models. Um, again, the complexity needs to be described in whatever way, or whatever way you can. And uh, when you have something that has to be complex, like the panel surfaces themselves, we need to find a way to draw and derive and, and, and uh, document in a way that uh, allows the fabricator and uh, the people sort of putting this thing together understand it. So I think we generated about 65,000 of these drawings, one person. I think if we were to meter over the production on this process, it's 400 and some odd drawings per day per person, uh, all 100% different. Um, let's see. This thing is not. Oh, okay. And then again, it's how do how do you put it together? And so for us, since everything is sort of indexed to a panel, which I'll get into in a second, uh, it was how do we develop a, a documentation language and a, uh, a means of assembling putting the panels together that uh, anybody can actually understand. Um, and so we kind of thought about it as an accusation approach where it's just a, a set of paper documents, index numbers, and a spreadsheet. And the guy just drops in the right part to the right spot uh, ad infinitum. Um, so again, stepping, stepping back into it, our scope was, again, very, very small. Uh, it was purely designing uh, sort of the uh, node cladding, just covering the freeform nodes. The, member cladding covering the three, four members, and the penetrations connecting back to the macro windows, uh, and the penetrations connecting back to the uh, primary structure. Um, and I'll kind of quickly go through some organizing logic, based kind of in the sort of way we had to design it, which normally we, it's probably not the best way, but time rules everything. So uh, the first thing you had to do was figure out a panelization. Again, you find some, some rough metrics from a fabricator, you kind of start to, to panelize the, the, the panels, and then you know, an algorithm will try to figure out where symmetry is, where symmetry isn't, 
and then swap uh, and kind of you know re, re sort of configure the uh, the joint locations to sort of create more aesthetically appealing logic. Uh, the second bit was probably the most stressful and complicated part of the sort of whole thing was dealing with the penetrations to support the building and support the macro windows, which had zero relationship to the joint locations, all sorts of framing nightmares to that. Um, again, the, the nodes, uh, similar logic. Uh, Zaha's office conveniently provided some design intent for what they were looking for, uh, and then go through a series of algorithms to either move, rotate, or whatever to meet the sort of you know, fabrication criteria. Uh, next from that, we have to determine all of the um, locations to the primary structure without actually having a system designed, um, which is very difficult because you don't know what you're supporting. You just have a panel and no framing. Um, but we had some very, very basic limitations. The shape could be basically four shapes. It was an angle, a plate, a square section, or a channel. Um, and that's what the steel fabricator imposed on us. We couldn't put it in certain locations. We had to design a system that basically eliminated a lot of tolerance issues. Um, so we go through some logic, you figure out the max span possibly you can hold, the max cantilever of a panel, and we decided on a plate was the best way because we could uh, document it readily, we could put it, um, sort of leverage some mean plane action, uh, which we'll get into, and then it provided some flexibility because we could put a bracket on either side of the plate didn't really matter. Uh, so it was just sort of something, a placeholder until we could figure out something later. Uh, the panelization, uh, actually no, the framing uh, here is, again, this mean plane, the savior of this project, provided every bit of rationalization you could possibly imagine. Uh, so you start with your structure, uh, you have your, your nodes, your mean plane in yellow, and your sort of, your node. Uh, you, you kind of impose your panelization on top of that, and then you, what we did was, Every, to keep all the parts rational and very simple, we use, again, square sections. You can't curve them, you can't do anything like that. So they are all singly curved parallel to the mean plane, uh, and they're sort of clipped by whatever logic. Uh, and then in between that, we have a sort of a U-channel stiffener that, again, is perpendicular to the mean plane. So again, it's all single curvature, very, very rational, and it's sort of uh, laid out whatever structural logic is required. Uh, and then, um, <laughs> but the mean plane also causes you problems. Because again, you, we, we have this sort of skew that happens in the panels as it's warping around. So the structure is very, very rational, but we're trying to solve the irrationality of the, the cladding. And as you, as you kind of move away from um, uh, a sort of a square shape, and then you're affecting a load in a very, very weak axis of the panel, you get a very, very inefficient system. So we had to find an, uh, sort of a line in which you have a hyper-efficient system and a hyper-inefficient system as a means of sort of mitigating uh, the amount of aluminum that goes in. So you jump from a very relatively thin plate and then you, you pass up to about 20 degrees and it just jumps into this enormously thick, hilariously large piece of aluminum. But there's not that many of them, so we found it as a very uh, convenient way to do it. And finally, the bane of our existence were the joint covers. Uh, and there are these little pieces of aluminum. They look fantastic, but they, they cover all the joints. Um, and there are about 340,000 of these individual components. They're all 100% different. Um, and because they're responding to uh, local conditions, uh, fastener locations, bracketry, what have you. Um, but again, we use the mean plane as a way of organizing that, uh, and then through our modeling process, it allows you to, say, generate cut files uh, and have, say, all the pre-located fastener locations, such that the guy on site doesn't have to think about where to put a hole, the guy in the factory doesn't have to think about a hole, it's all CNC located. So it was a, ultimately a very, very convenient way of thinking. So let Ramon talk about our really big model. So now that Evan has explained all the constraints and everything that we actually had to, uh, had to deliver, uh, thousands of millions of pieces all had to be documented and, and readily uh, made ready to be produced. Uh, the question is, of course, how are we actually going to do that? Um, so that was my job on this project. And uh, as was already explained in the presentations uh, before, um, 
it cannot be done by conventional methods of just drawing 2D, et cetera. It, it has to be done in 3D because there is no other way to, uh, to coordinate all this. And not just has, uh, does it have to be uh, modeled in 3D, it also then has to be actually fabricated and assembled and installed. So I will talk a little bit to that. Um, I guess most of us know what parametric modeling is, but I'm going to explain a little bit of it as to, to make the link to how our modeling process is set up. So parametric modeling is basically just a way of defining relationships to uh, inputs and outputs. You provide some inputs, you specify what happens to these inputs, we call that a function, and then you will be given uh, outputs. These um, uh, outputs can then again be used as inputs for the next function. They will do something and they will provide new outputs and so on and so forth. This starts to look like a grasshopper definition and basically that's what grasshopper does. It's just a bunch of inputs and outputs. Um, however, um, in in, in the philosophy that I'm about to describe, the way we worked um, for this project at Front, uh, we, we take this um, a step further as in considering entire models to be an input and entire grasshopper definitions to be a function. And again, new models to be an output or new spreadsheets to be an output or those kind of things. Um, so how that works is we want to generate geometry, but not just geometry. The geometry needs to contain information because information is almost just as important as, as the geometry, uh, if not even more important. Um, so in this case, what, what we're after, um, this is just a simple example of how we would take a building envelope and assign names to each facet and store this information in the geometry as such. This model with the attributed uh, facets can then be used as an input to a function together with, for instance, what are the openings that we need in this building. And then the output of this function could be the facade that has the openings trimmed out of it. Uh, as a next step, we could take the, the grid of this building, and I'm showing this building because it's a little bit more easy to understand. It's much less complicated than the one that we're actually talking about. Take the grid of the building, project the grid onto this, um, onto this facade. So basically we have a facade, we have a grid as our inputs, and as outputs we get the panels of the building. As a next step, we can take the actual elevation drawing of the architect as an input, take the 3D model as the other input, and then project all the information from the drawing onto this building such that for each panel we now know exactly what it is. Is it glass? Is it spandrel? Is it, is it a grill? Is it an AC unit? Uh, whatsoever. And we store all that information inside of the geometry. So you can see this kind of thing starting to progress where we use all these inputs um, being the models and we combine all these models and in such a way we actually generate uh, we generate data. It's not just generating geometry, but in combining all this information, we also generate new information. So for this uh, specific project, that would lead to a model that actually is just not geometry, and it's not just on an incredibly large scale, but all the geometry now also um, is kind of intelligent in that there is a lot of information stored in this geometry. So in this specific um, example, you could see one of these connections that is just a connection that holds the joint cover in its place. It knows exactly which node it is a part of. It knows which panel it is a part of. It knows which side of the node it actually sits. Um, it, it knows what its relationship is to other panels, um, et, et cetera, et cetera. All kind of identifications, orientations are all stored in there. So um, here you can see that in, in this way, we kind of create an entire um, model ecosystem where we use Rhino models as inputs, we use grasshopper definitions as functions, and then we create Rhino models as outputs. And, and we do that again and again and again. And we start simple, we start with an envelope, we start with a grid, and then we project grids onto the envelope, and so on and so forth. Now, the way we do that is similar to uh, what Emilio just um, also explained, 
um, you have to be able to author your own tools in order to do that. Um, and at Front, um, we actually developed our own software. Um, we developed a, a plugin for Grasshoppers called Elefront. And it is the thing that actually enables us to generate information on a large scale. And uh, building information generation is what we're doing. We're not just building information modeling. We're not just modeling. We're generating geometry, but we're also generating information while we're doing that. So for this particular project, and this is just only simplification, um, we used over 3,000 stages. And each stage is basically take one model, process it through, a, through Grasshopper, build a new model over 3,000 times in our project folder just for these models. The master model at the moment contain over 220 gigabytes worth of data. So as an example, how that goes, um, a stiffener. A stiffener seems like a very simple element. It's just a single bent piece of, of U, uh, U shape profile. And we need a lot of them to, um, to make sure that the panel is actually stiff enough to support a large person jumping on it, cleaning the windows. In order to get to where that one little single stiffener should go, uh, we need a lot of inputs. Again, we need those mean planes that are driving all the geometry for all the three traits that, 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 have, that we've seen tonight. Um, we also need all the tieback locations to the steel, which we had to basically provide before we knew anything else, because they had to go on the steel first. It was the first thing to go up. For us, actually, um, rationally would be the last thing we know. First you would want to design all the framing for your panel and then you know where the, where the cleat, the structure goes. In this case we had to do that first, so it's now an input. Um, of course we have the envelope and we have all the penetrations through the envelope um, in, in, in the shape of, of these stubs. One step in the model, we take all this, everything is attributed, everything knows what it is, where it is, and, and we know what, what, in, what um, interacts with each other. And in such a way, we know where the brackets are, we know where the steel is, and so we also know where not to put any stiffeners, because we just cannot, there is no room for stiffener there. So we would actually create geometry to tell us, to inform us where not to put these stiffeners. And we would be left over with whatever is there, we can actually put stiffeners on and we would distribute them along these allowable stiffener zone. And then the next step in this process would be the grasshopper definition actually generating these stiffener wireframes for us. Following this logic, we could apply this on all the parts in the building. Every model would then serve as an input for the next one, and we, we could create basically any, any type of shape with this set of parts that was possibly available in the building. So this is a little animation to, to show how this modeling actually came together. So we started with the steel, thanks to Emilio. Uh, it was awesome. We did some attributing to it. Um, we get the envelope surface model from Zaha. Thanks, Michele. And then we had to indeed determine where the joints would go, determine what the panel size would be. Maximum panel size, architectural intent would be our inputs. The joint locations, different on the front, different on the back, different on the side, um, all determined by the edge of the panel, um, trimming away. And in this, in this step, we actually start to see the shapes of the panels, all the surfaces, all the panels now have one surface. They know where they are, they know what they are. We would name them, we would give them all kinds of attributes. Looking inside, we can now see, again, the mean planes. They're driving um, all of the primary grid lines. This would set out the ladder frames, the main, the main rails on the panels. And they would always have a specific hierarchy. The longer ones first, and so on and so forth, and this hierarchy will determine how the trimming happens from one frame to the other, from one ladder to the other. 
the edges of the panel and the penetrations of the stub would also determine the rest of the trims and the rest of the secondary frame. And all these reference curves now are multiplied so that each cardinal point will be represented for each rail. And similar to the stiffener uh, example, we would create geometry to show where not to have any rails. And we would trim all of these, all of these reference lines away. And this would start to hint to what the actual frame should be. Now we can create surfaces based on these reference wires. And this starts to show what the actual rail looked like. Next, siphoners. We have center lines going through these rails and we can make divisions and actually then automatically, and I cannot stress enough, this is all done automatically for hundreds of panels at a time, single, single processes, single clicks. And then the siphoner pro profile is extruded along the wire. We would get primary panel brackets that would relate back to the cleats, back to the main structure. We already know where that is. Secondary brackets, those are kind of the blind brackets that just have to slide in from the side. And then a very, a very difficult portion is actually tying the whole frame back to the sheet and there are hundreds of thousands of connections all fastened by welded studs to the panel. Um, they all had to be in a very specific place at a very specific angle. Joint covers are added and also these joint covers needed again all these connections, all these holes in the right place, all these welded studs in the right place. So it's starting to look very complicated. Side brackets, so these brackets are modeled as if they were part of the panel, but ultimately, of course, are fabricated and installed on site first. But this is just the modeling process, how this thing came together one step at a time. Other side brackets, you can see a lot of uh, possibilities for adjustments, slotted holes in every direction. So this whole panel is then tied back to the steel by these cleats that were actually uh, created as one of the very first steps. And this is just one panel, but we would do like a few hundred of these panels in, in one go. And everything is basically just generated automatically. And every of these parts uh, learns all the information from its predecessors. So every, every part now exactly knows which, which, every connection knows which frame it is connecting to, which panel it's connecting to, what the panel is, where it is, and so on and so forth. So, Evan will talk about the then one. We modeled everything, then the question is, of course, is it right? Yeah, and that's, for us, the $64,000 question. Um, did you get it right? Uh, how do you check it's right when you've got millions of pieces? Um, kind of like software developments, uh, embedded in each of the logics that we have in the kind of grasshopper scripts, we develop unit testing. Um, and it's just sort of, it, it's basic, basic checks. Uh, you know, the, it won't let you basically bake until, or create the new model until you've passed all of the checks. Uh, have you met all the structural engineering requirements? Have you had the right number of planes? And basically it alerts you on a very, very low level if you're doing something wrong. Um, and this is kind of the first pass of, of, of checking. Um, secondly, you can empirically validate all parametrically divided objects. Um, and since we, we, we take extreme efforts to make sure everything is, is, is describable in as many forms as possible, um, you know, you could FEA model every single bit of frame. That may be kind of silly because it's, it's, it's time consuming um, and you don't need to for very simple calculations. So for example, you know, you can quickly load up 8,000 panels, check the cantilever on each one, and again, we identified seven out of 8,000 that were out outside of the, sort of operating outside the boundaries. And then, it, you know, it highlights which panels they are. You go back, you add a little piece of structure, you're good to go. You can also FEA check everything if you want uh, as well. And similar to uh, Bureau Hapold, we've developed uh, some software ourselves to create direct model, uh, links, real-time links between um, our modeling environment and our, our, strand, our, our FEA model of choice, uh, strand seven. Um, but that link is also super bi-directional. So we can bring back the information into Rhino and do things uh, that are really hard to do uh, in FEA, like measure deflection based on length criteria and things like that. So we can empirically check very quickly if we have any stiffeners or framing members that are outside operating outside the bounds. Because again, rules are rules. 
you're going to break them in this process. Um, you can do that 20,000 times, no problem. Uh, take some time. Uh, but also, since everything is describable in various formats, we can, you can develop tools in this time, uh, Excel sheet, to quickly check in a very broad sense if you have problematic panels. Is anything overstressed? Is anything over deflecting? It'll highlight those and you can go back and fix them. Uh, sort of the next sort of level of checking is rebuilding the model from the data. So it's basically eating your old dog food um, where I'm going to take all the fabrication data, rerun it through the same algorithm that generated it, and rebuild it, and then check to see if it works. Uh, and and most, empirically, uh, most parametric pieces can do that. So you have a sort of template, check it, and it, it's good to go. Um, the kind of last step uh, is, is, again, to do things computers can't do very well, is to visually QA, QC everything. So uh, in, inside each of the parts, for example, there's like a camera orientation that's stored. Uh, you hit a couple buttons, out pop a directory of images, out pops a populated Excel sheet. Just click one by one, check out for gross deficiencies, you check for things that are missing, something that's malformed, you record it, you go back and fix it. Um, again, if you're telling a computer to do that, next to impossible at this point. Telling your brain to do it, super easy. Um, I'll pass back to Ramon for the next step of actually how to get all this stuff out onto paper and into someone to make it. So we now have this model, this huge model with all these parts, and we know that it's correct. Now we still need to find a way to actually convey the information. And as with, with also uh, Emilio, at that point, we still don't necessarily know who is going to make it. So the way this is set up makes for a very flexible, like the fact that we have all this information stored makes for very flexible ways of output. We can output every part as a drawing, as a cut file, as a diagram, um, as a different modeling format. doesn't really matter because we're very flexible and we have to be because, again, we don't really know. Um, to this point where we actually have to start outputting. And the fabricator is chosen, and uh, in collaboration with the fabricator, we would choose for every, for every individual part how they want this information to be conveyed. Uh, as an example, we've seen the, we've seen the same uh, image or similar. Um, it was chosen that these panels would get their, their own template. Each panel would get their own template and, um, and would, be, would be formed like this. So, this is a shot of one, of one of our models. And in order to get this panel fabricated, we need to know exactly where all the connections to the panel are. And we also need to know um, roughly indicating where all the framing should go. So basically, this is where all the connections are. These are all the intersections. This is where all stud, welded studs need to go. And this is all CNC document. We would provide them with a model with exactly this. And, and these, these dots are actually colored because they represent different types of, of, of studs, different lengths for different parts. And everything is stored in there so they know exactly where, where to put what. This will be put flat or as flat as possible. And then this template frame would actually be uh, generated uh, also by us. And this is all fully automated process. And this is just all done for hundreds of panels at a time. This is what it looks from, from the bottom. Now, we provide these files to the fabricator, but the fabricator really, really wanted a way to also check if their work is actually correct. So we had to provide check drawings for every single panel. For instance, this is a drawing that describes exactly the length of all the edges in, in, in flat plane and along the edge, and it would also uh, indicate some dimensions um, across the panel from one corner to the other, and also some heights from the, from the ground level, it's hard to see, but there, there are a lot of dimensions on there. And these drawings are, are all generated automatically, and there are hundreds, thousands of them. So this is just basically only the sheet itself, but of course we also need to know exactly where all these connections, all these welded studs go. So again, we have here all these, all these items that need to go on the panel. And also for that, they wanted, um, they want a, a 2D drawing. So this is basically a process where we turn this 3D geometry directly into a 2D drawing. Um, and that would be printed directly to PDF like this and provided to the contractor such that they would have ways to check every single stud if it is exactly in the correct, um, in the correct place. 
So this was a sheet. And um, I'm going to give one more example of, for instance, a piece of frame. Um, talking to the fabricator, we said, we can provide you a single drawing for each piece of frame with dimensions. It was going to be like hundreds of thousands of drawings. They said, we don't want that. Just give us a diagram with all the parameters laid out on there and just provide us a spreadsheet that gives us all the values for each element. So we're going to have a look at this particular piece of frame. Um, we would just lay out all the frames for one batch onto a flat, uh, a flat um, XY plane. And uh, this is the one we would just looked at. And all the parameters are just extracted directly from this piece of geometry. The radius, sometimes there are multiple radius, where the holes should go, where the location of the holes are along the center line, and so on and so forth. And all this information would be stored as a single line into an Excel spreadsheet. So they would get one diagram, one big spreadsheet, and they could just start making this, making this element. And the drawing would, would look like this, angled offcuts, holes in various locations, various bending, bending radii, and so on and so forth. And everything was made just of that. Then the whole thing, of course, had to be put together. So also that we had to provide to them. Uh, we call these the assembly documents. But since all the locations of all the elements are CNC controlled by all these stud welds and all the holes are already pre-drilled in the right locations, it's basically just a matter of putting the whole thing together like an IKEA, like an IKEA package. Uh, all we did was for each panel we provided an image just like this one, showing where the parts would go and each part would get a number and this would tie back to a spreadsheet where each number would basically identify exactly the part ID for this specific item that they created from the diagram with all the parameters uh, and put it in a box with a label. And, and we created literally tens of thousands of drawings exactly like this one, such that they could just like have a guy with a box of toys just putting everything together and just fastening it and it should just all end up in, in the correct place. And this is the final shot. This is just a shot of a small portion of the model that shows the insane amount of, of elements that are all automatically generated, all unique, all curved, bent, and, and are being now, as we speak, uh, put together on site. That was it. Thanks to Ramon and Evan and all the speakers. Um, our first speaker tonight, Viviana, has to get on a plane in a couple hours. Um, so she has to leave within minutes. So maybe what I can do is invite all of the presenters to, to sit in one of the chairs in the front. And if there are any questions from the audience, perhaps I could ask for one or two questions for Viviana um, or Zaha Hadid Architects first. And then we'll have a, uh, as you go to the uh, airport, we'll continue with our Q&A session. Any questions? We'll also be taking some questions from Shanghai. OK, I'm going to start with the first question. Um, and maybe, Viviana, you could ask, answer uh, as the you know, project architect leading the project on a really truly global project, as you said, 24-hour project. What are the things that you learned about practice in managing such a complex project in terms of geometry and pieces um, and consultants, but also time and place and space across the, across the continents? Thank you for all of you to keep up with us while we were presenting. I told you at the beginning that we were not only, there were a lot of brains on this project, but a lot of passion. So we are a little bit long when presenting this project, but I think you all got the sense of it. In terms of uh, the lesson learned on this project is that um, somehow in engineering, in architecture, we tend to forget um, that we have right now the tools and to, that are our computers to uh, uh, make 
project that was saying a few times is insane and really complex, very simple to fabricate. So the, the, the industry is ready. Uh, I think our brain, they need to be switched on, on make other and more of projects like this happen. They can be possible, they can be in the limit on the industry and uh, we really have to challenge ourselves every time we do a project. Uh, architecture, engineering, fabricator, uh, they are, the, the industry is really ready for this and uh, we need to set the engine to really get what, as they said, is really complex or insane to become some sort of the you know, everyday approach to our profession. I truly believe that uh, we didn't invent the computers to play PlayStation. We invented computers to do those kind of things. Our brain is here, I mean, here in London, across the globe. I mean, this project is not only Zadid project, it's everyone's project. Uh, the brain is there, we have really excellent people around, the computer also there, let's stop playing PlayStation and try to do more of this. I think I, I want to challenge people here in this audience to really uh, try it out. I mean, th this was built, it's been built. Uh, uh, I hope you can all come to the opening uh, in, in uh, next year time. And uh, so that's, I think, that's the, le the big lesson for, for me and I hope for everyone that built to cope with us with this long presentation. Great, thanks. Any other questions for Viviana? Question from Shanghai. We're, I'm going to have... <laughs> We're using high tech and low tech. <laughs> this, is, this is called a telephone. So is there a strategy for overall assembly on site? Do you want to address that from the architect's perspective? Or how did that, how did design uh, and architecture play into assembly and construction? I think what um, Hermidius pointed out before, because this building is not a standard building, as ne never like that has been built, and it goes out of every code for structure, for facade, uh, effectively, it had been hardly tested against uh, the performance for wind, for heat it build up. And uh, I hope we made enough provision for it. I mean, we, there are, of course, some movement joints in the cladding. They've been all worked out with a lot of work from uh, Victoria and the facade team of Euro uh, There are provision in the way this, this uh, facade from the structure to the cladding will breathe and move. So yes, uh, we, we, uh, I think we, because, because there is no code, we had to take it even uh, one step up when being sure that eventually this fantastic building stays there for a very, very long time. It's supposed to be 200 years, the return, <laughs> the return on this building. So I don't know if you want to add something a little bit more technical than me or... <laughs> I guess really what it goes back to is, is when you don't have your 99% of your rules going back to your, your codes, your books, then really you seem to start reeling it back and go back to your first principles. So we showed you we used this scalpel finite element analysis tool, yes, but what came before all of it was, okay, what is the fundamental principle 
behind what we need to do, what is the strategy in which we're going to use this tool to be able to have the most effect. And I think that's right in line with what you're saying. You don't have a book, make up and make something up and be smart about it. Okay, well, I'd, I'd like to thank Viviana for a few more minutes. You got to go. Yeah. <laughs> Let's, a round of applause for uh, Viviana for flying all the way from London. And we'll carry on. We're running a bit late, but we'll carry on for a bit because the opportunities uh, like what's in front of us are hard to pass by. Any other questions from the audience? Should Sujata. Thank you very much. It's, uh, I think uh, like Greek and Latin for a lot of people, uh, including me. But I wanted to ask you one thing in terms of sustainability. How do the you know this building would rate, and also in terms of uh, cost ratio from a regular building to a building like this, what would be the factor? Where should we start? <laughs> it's a very big question. Uh, actually, uh, we were looking at. At, at the aluminum weight uh, before a few images with Viviana before having, having this conference. And it's quite interesting to see, uh, in spite how many, how many tons of aluminum have been used for the molds and for the stiffeners and for the, yeah, sorry, and <laughs> during the whole fabrication, fabrication process, Actually, uh, all this waste is going to be reused, is going to be um, sold by the fabricator and reused for different things. So, uh, in spite of the complex geometry, uh, everything is going to be reused all the ways. And maybe yeah, I mean, I think upfront sustainability may, be, may not be the most forefront, but it's, again, it's a structure that's design minimum 100 year return uh, on, on most analysis and a life, theoretical lifespan of 200 years, um, which is, you, people are designing for that. Um, so inherently the material, any upfront costs are, are you know, mitigated over the lifespan of the building. As long as you're designing and thinking about long-term um, long structures, uh, then I think you're are able to take on these more adventurous and, and complex things uh, just by looking at something that's well beyond any of our lifespans. Yeah, I agree with that. And the other thing is, is like I was showing you with the, the different forms of analyses, um, there really is only one level above where we could have gone to try and save material. Obviously, we did the optimization up front. For the connections, the only thing we could have done a little bit more is not feasible in the modern era, which is uh, incorporating what's called plastic design. Everything hit, did, we did here was elastic. Um, and the problem with that, of course, is with the time frames and with what you're dealing with, there's just the computational power to actually run those types of models is not there. So for the given era, as far as material uses goes, that's about as good as you're going to get. And you saw it's about three times as bad if you're going and using other methodologies. Thanks. Actually, uh, back to the erection question. Um, I assume that Bureau Hubble, you guys provided Tecla models to the fabricator for them to fabricate? No. 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 That, that was purely on 2D drawings and... So for the flat side, there we could incorporate 2D drawings. Now those were above and beyond any sort of connection drawings that you're normally seeing. But we were able to pull that off. For the freeform section, all they got was that fly-through that we showed you. Of a 3D Rhino information, because that's our tool of choice, but they could take that into whatever they wanted to use, and, and that one uh, A3 detailed drawing of the, how it went together. Did you guys have to provide them with any information? Like, for example, when they erected it, I assume there's some erection tolerance that they had to accommodate. Um, how was that accommodated? That was, did the fabricator do it themselves? Um, do you guys provide updated geometry, or how how that work? It's a very cool process that uh, the fabricator in China was undergoing. Um, to answer your question first, so 
we would give them our connection details. We did a under, underwent a whole construction stage analysis like, like never done before. Really, really complex stuff to understand and to find the right software to do it, just so they can understand what happens when you have such complex load paths and, and everything connected together as you build it. That was to aid them. And then in the fab yard, you could actually see that they had these tools to go in there and survey things as they made things and inform some sort of, I don't, I'm not a professional on this particular software, but they were using a software that linked into Tecla as well as survey data from the shop, from site, so that if they did need to adjust things based on tolerances and everything, which we gave them, uh, they could do that in the shop as much as possible. And it's worked out pretty well for them, it looks like. No, no problem. That's a whole other lecture. <laughs> I wonder if any of the presenters has a question for another presenter. <laughs> oh, you're blowing my mind. <laughs> I mean, I think since we all speak the same language, I thought it was very, you know, amenable process. I mean, in construction, things can go sour pretty fast, but we're all here talking about something in various stages, and I think it's a testament to good things that happen. It doesn't be an old peace and love, of course, because we, we struggle between each other during uh, millions of go-to-meeting, millions of conference calls, so it has be very interesting and nice, nice uh, experience. And I want to thank these guys because, uh, honestly, I also learned a lot to work with you. All of us, we are very, very proud of what, what, what is going on on site these days. So, yeah, thank you. Uh, so, they said this at the beginning, like Michele and Viviana haven't been out here for a while. So, you were out there yesterday, it's coming together. What's like the one thing that you saw that was like, wow, like unbelievable, we didn't expect it to look that awesome? Actually, it's plenty of them. <laughs> uh, I've been on site last time, on last December, and there is a lot of progress uh, in this only six months, how much. Uh, if I want to spot something, probably uh, the curved structure uh, at the top of the belly, the image, there, there's one image we have shown, it's pretty amazing. I mean, uh, you look at it and you wonder how how can be there? And we know that it's there, and we have worked a lot <laughs> to, to get it there. But it's actually very amazing. And also the cladding, the first, the first nodes, uh, double curve nodes installed on site are. I mean, we are we are very excited. We have been very also Bianca from Hong Kong office were with us, and it was amazing. We are re really happy of, of what is happening. Yeah. Uh, one question for me, actually, it's a very um, uh, fundamental question. First of all, I, I noticed that the uh, glass cladding actually is behind the structure and also uh, there will be cladding over the structure. So in terms of the um, installation, you will put the glass first and then uh, you do the cladding over the structure. Is that the uh, process? If that's the process, and I have one question, um, in the event of um, later on, you have to replace one of the uh, busted glass panel, uh, are you gonna do it from inside or you do it from outside? And the second question is, uh, what is the, uh, the uh, cleaning system uh, it's gonna do uh, in this entire building? Do you want to answer this one? It's all, it's all you. You're, you're the one who came up with this. <laughs> to answer backwards, this project, with this project, in every turn, in every part, is complex. So everything you described is complex. So the cleaning system is complex. Uh, yes. So what is a complex cleaning system? <laughs> We've gone through many, uh, Victoria can answer it, but uh, you know, the, there's been things that have been bespoke that have never been done before. Cleaning, uh, the replacement of glasses from the inside generally, from inside. 
Yes. And, uh, and, the, and the, the glass itself is a bit of a, glass curtain wall is a little bit of a hybrid. It's not, it's a bit of a, uh, we install the spandrels first and uh, put in glass infill similar to ICC uh, because, of, because of the geometry and uh, the way we work around some of those penetrations. In the pre-formary particularly um, that we've been looking at today, that is all replaced uh, externally by great access for cleaning and for glass replacement as well. There's a number of um, quite innovative uh, products like inflatable uh, pillows, rope systems, straps and all sorts that enable the process of glass replacement in that area. It's not easy. <laughs> there's so there's there's abseiling, extensive use of abseiling throughout the freeform area. So basically mountain climbers. So if it was a Hong Kong job, it was. I don't need a mic no more. Shanghai. <laughs> oh, Shanghai. Sorry. It's a um, it's a it's a project. I always say that probably it, it's it's complex in world terms. Uh, but it's even more complex if you had to try to build it in Hong Kong because there's many rules in Hong Kong that wouldn't allow us to do this. Uh, uh, the, the entire team delivered a lot of drawings and in some ways didn't deliver a lot of drawings because we basically piped a lot of information to the contractors without actually sort of bypassing the 2D paper realm. But if we do this in Hong Kong, I had to go through, say, DD, for example, uh, it would never have been able to achieve in the time, especially. You know. So we've heard about studs, we've heard about supermodels, we're talking about a little bit of dirt. Um, I think the, maybe the evening's getting on, or maybe it's been too late for me, but. Um, I want to thank again all the presenters for an amazing set of lectures and the audience and the audience who's still here for sticking it out. I think I, I'm realizing that I told a lie at the beginning of the lecture and that the building is not complete yet, but now I realize that the building has actually been completed dozens of times by the people sitting in, in front. Um, and I think each of the firms here as well, the firms not represented uh, on the stage today, but on the team are really pushing the envelopes of architectural technology in a way that's going to benefit the, well, humanity, ideally, especially if you're winning in the, in the casino. Um, thanks to everyone. We can continue the conversation if there are any drinks left. Thanks again to Herman Miller uh, for sponsoring and, and uh, humoring our slightly tardy finishing time. And I hope to see you all again at the next AIA event. All right, thanks again. And thanks to, <laughs> thank you to everyone in Shanghai for tuning in over the telephone. Uh, we hope that everything was clear and you could see and hear uh, fantastic presentations here. We will try to do this again in the future. Thanks to, and thanks to all the administrative and technical staff for allowing the presentations to be video recorded and streamed uh, in real time. So we'll see you very soon. Thanks again.